All right. Hello, everyone. I'd like to give you a taste of generators and coroutines. I'll only focus on the user side and uh, the user usage. And I'm actually not going to explain a lot of the compiler magic that happens behind the scenes. There are some excellent resources which I'll point to at the end. Uh, but I hope to stimulate you to go and learn more. So say we want to iterate over all the elements of a vector. We can write a function or a subroutine to do that. And we can see that this function actually does two things. It iterates over a sequence, and then it does some operation which, uh, onto each element of the sequence. If we wanted to apply and to do another operation, we'd actually have to write another function. Now let's see another example. Say we want to draw a line. We can go to uh, various algorithm books or online resources. Don't try to check this one. This is only a partial line implementation. And usually what you see would be code that looks similar to this code of the, uh, the draw line function here. And again, it actually does two things. It iterates over a sequence. In this case, it's the pixels, the rasterized pixels along the line. And it draws the pixel to the screen using a function called put pixel. Now, draw line actually assumes some, several things about this function called pixel. It assumes that it, it's available so that you can comp compile and link with it. It assumes it has the correct signature. It assumes that it does the correct thing when we actually call it in mid-computation. And we're actually assuming, this is a little bit more implicit, that it will re return the control flow to draw line when, uh, for continuing our computation. So we can see a general pattern here that subroutines are actually, they have two properties. First of all is they're eager. They eagerly process the whole sequence before finishing or terminating, and, and they're also closed. They have a predefined operation which they apply to each of the sequence elements. So you might say yes, but one common mitigation of, of uh, handling this, this thing is callbacks. We can pass external callback functions to our own function, and actually C++ offers multiple mechanisms for using callbacks, and this is in fact how many STL algorithms work. However, callbacks themselves have their own set of issues. For example, in inversion of control means that we're calling external code that is not necessarily known to be trustworthy, valid, or correct from our own library. And we're kind of assuming that it is because we are still in mid-computation. And additionally, uh, there is something called callback hell, where the program, the program flow is skipping between uh, many decoupled parts of the code. And the code actually becomes extremely hard to uh, understand, to reason about, to debug, and to maintain, and not to mention additional potential uh, performance issues. And even still, call, even when we're using callbacks, our code is still eager. It still wants to process the whole, uh, in, the whole sequence before finishing. So if only there was a way to sort of flip these functions inside out and iterate the sequence without pre-committing to a specific operation. OK, we're all fami familiar with iterators. Um, iterators were introduced in, uh, by uh, Stepanov in 1993 and became part of the STL uh, standard library in 1998. And they're often standalone types, which are only indirectly or implicitly coupled to an actual concrete sequence. And we have many examples in our standard. We have the iStream iterator, which reads element from an input stream using the input iterator, reverse iterator, basically uh, adapts the, reverses the direction of a given iterator uh, for iterating from back to front. And C++17 brings us, for example, the recursive directory iterator, which is an iterator object that recursively iterates over all the elements in a file system and, or, uh, uh, and all its subfolders. Now, an interesting point here is that the file system directory sub subtree hierarchy is the sequence we're iterating on. Our program doesn't have an actual sequence uh, like a vector that it needs to iterate on. So basically, we have uh, conceptually, we have a sequence in our program, although it only implicitly exists in, inside our program. So, but we can also write our own iterator types. So I decided to pick on OpenCV, and OpenCV has a type called CV line iterator. It's used to iterate over all the pixels on a rasterized line connecting two points. It has a typical iterator object type API. I simplified it a bit for brevity. 
Uh, and note that in, uh, it doesn't have an explicit sequence that it's iterating over. It lazily, and this is an important word, it lazily calculates the pixel position when the iterator is incremented. And it implements various Bresenham algorithms for different conditions. So, and how do we use such an iterator object? Here's uh, some code copied from the OpenCV documentation, which tries to copy the pixels along the line into a buffer. So, but alternatively, we may uh, decide we want to draw the line by setting colors to the pixels. Maybe we want to do some uh, fancy color gradients along the line. But you, as you can see, we're creating an iterator object, uh, uh, giving it uh, an image and two points. We're creating a buffer, a suitably sized buffer, and then we're iterating on the iterator, it dot count times, and copying the current pixel value and incrementing the iterator. We can argue if this is the most elegant uh, interface with the horrible uh, public members, but that's not really the point I'm trying, to, uh, I'm not trying to fix OpenCV's line iterator. I, am, I, I actually want to point to two more, uh, two problems that are actually more general and are, uh, affect most iterator types. So, because iterators too are an imperfect abstraction. So, how do we know when to stop incrementing the iterator? How do we know when the sequence is done? And this is a question that all iterator objects must be able to answer. So if we look at our examples, CV line iterator, as we saw, we must increment at most it dot count times. Istream iterator becomes equal to the global default constructor, maybe a universal Istream iterator. Our reverse iterator becomes equal to the our end iterator from the underlying sequence, and the recursive directory iterator becomes equal to calling the standalone std end function on the iterator. Now, we can see each of these uh, APIs chose a slightly different condition in a slightly, way, uh, slightly different way for deciding or letting the user know when to stop. Now, the last two examples demonstrate one of the biggest drawbacks of iterator abstraction, that the end iterator is tightly coupled at runtime to the begin iterator objects. And this is a major pitfall when the end iterator is of the correct type, but not created from the same sequence. So that passing such a pair to an STL algorithm will actually cause undefined behavior, and your code may, com in the worst case, the your code will actually compile, but uh, you may have nasal demons. So C++ 20 is bringing us ranges, and ranges really are the solution to this awkward coupling problem because it's an abstraction layer on top of iterator. That's because a range, a C++ 20 range, encapsulates a begin iterator and an end iterator pair. It, also, it can also encapsulate an iterator in a size or an iterator in a stopping condition, but it's still a single object that we can pass to the ranges uh, STL algorithms, making them much more powerful and composable and allowing us to create pipes. Uh, there is a ton more to say about ranges and my focus here is that I want to contemplate how some ranges might, may actually be implemented by uh, a user, by us, by us as, uh, as users to be able to interact with additional ranges. And since ranges are generalized iterators, implementing them still suffered from, the, um, from another difficulty that also plagues it other iterator object implementations. And distributed logic is really the iterator cousin of callback hell. Because the iterator API implementation requires us to have distributed logic and centralized state. So while the loop iteration, uh, the, the iteration loop is externalized, which is what we wanted to begin with, the intermediate computation variables and state is stored, uh, are stored as mutable members, as we can see there at the top. And the iteration logic and the whole algorithm logic is split between the constructor and other member methods like the uh, plus plus increment operator. And if we look at the CV line, specifically at the CV line uh, iterator example, we can see that the con at the beginning, the constructor, which I haven't shown the implementation here, sets up a lot of the member variables. The user can deref and increment the iterator at most count times, and the current pixel along the line is the one pointed to by the member PTR. Now, 
the body of the operator plus plus computes the next element to the, to the reference, and basically it's equivalent to the for, to the, if we had written this line iterator as a function algorithm, then the operator plus plus body would be what we'd see inside the for loop. Now, the second thing, which is the centralized state, is that we're storing the intermediate data as persistent members in the object, and this way, we actually don't take advantage of scope definitions and locality. We're giving all the methods access to these, uh, to modify these members, uh, where not all methods actually need access to these, and, and this, is, this could be a source when we're writing these, this type of types. Uh, it can be a source for bugs and uh, maybe even increasing the object size. So we can compare the distributed logic implementation that we saw to maybe a function called process line where I'm reverting this line iterator implementation to a function on the left, which I call process line. And you can see I basically copy pasted all the data from all the members and functions from uh, line iterator into the body of the function processing line. So line iterator had the problem of distributed logic, but it was not, uh, gave us lazy uh, iteration over the pixel, and it was open because we could do whatever we want with these pixels. On the other hand, if we look at process line, we have a single function which is linear and easy to reason about, but again, because it's a, fun a regular subroutine or function, it's eager and closed. So, if only there was a way to write a simple serial loop algorithm while still somehow abstracting away the iteration. And the answer is coroutine. Now, coroutines are not a new concept. In fact, they were uh, coined by Melvin Conway in 1958. And Boost has had several coroutine implementation of the years, and I've seen C libraries going back to at least before uh, the beginning of the millennium. And a coroutine is a function that can suspend execution, returning an intermediate value, and be resumed later from the same point by re-entry. And in contrast to threads, which are preemptive, coroutine switches are cooperative. So the programmer who wrote the coroutine controls when the, this yielding, this uh, uh, suspension happens. And in this case, the kernel scheduler is not actually involved. So this is a totally uh, something that happens in the user thread. Now, if we think about it, returning an intermediate result in mid-computation sounds just like what we wanted. So if we look at process line again, and if process line was a coroutine, then instead of calling do something at the bottom in the loop body, we could somehow suspend execution at that point and just yield the current value of PTR. Later, the user can do whatever it wa uh, they want with this value and resume the computation for where we left off when, once they're ready. So C++ 20 brings us coroutines. And let's see a little bit about what C++ coroutines are. So a C++ 20 function is a coroutine if its body uses the coroutine operator to suspend execution until it's resumed again or if it uses the keyword co yield to suspend execution, returning a value, or if it uses the, co the keyword co return to complete execution and return a value. Now, how do we know if a function is a coroutine? We can't, not from its signature, because coroutines are actually an implementation detail of a function, and only if its body uses one of these special keywords can we determine if it's a coroutine. So, there's a lot to say about coroutines, and, and uh, uh, Louis Baker just gave a talk, and there are many other talks I'll link to at the end, and we're only going to scratch the surface of the capabilities of this new feature of the language, and in fact, I'm only going to look, we don't have a, long a lot of time, so I'm only going to look at coroutines from a very, very narrow view of creating synchronous generators from the user perspective. And practically, this means that we're only going to be focusing on the co-yield keyword. Okay. So let's see some code. Here's a little function, Zorro. And what does Zorro return? Returns 42. Uh, the return type is int, of course. And is it a coroutine? No, it isn't, because we saw its body 
again, we don't look at the signature. Its body doesn't use one of the special keywords. So here is another function called coru. What does it return? Actually, it doesn't return 42. And the return type is not int. And of course, it's a coroutine because it uses the coroutine co keyword. So how would we use coru? Like we use any other iterator object. A, key, a generator is a range, so we can put it in a range for loop, which in this case will run just once and print 42. We can also use a, uh, unroll this loop manually and create a generator gen, retrieve the begin iterator into IT, and then deref IT to get uh, 42. But note that unlike the iStream iterator, which you may be familiar with, the first value that is 42, will only be ready after we call begin for the first time and not upon construction, like uh, iStream iterator. So, obviously single element ranges, that's not what you're here for, they're kind of boring. But since, remember, coroutines are lazy, they yield their elements one at a time, we can very easily generate infinite ranges. So we have our IOTA coroutine here, and this infinite loop will suspend at every iteration yielding the current value and only resume on demand. So we can call std copy n with IOTA giving it 42, asking for nine elements, printing it out to see out, and we're getting 42 through 50. Now, I just want to emphasize again, although we have an infinite loop, because we're lazy, we're allowed to do that and we don't need any stopping conditions. And this is not Necessary. This is not actually going to be an infinite loop unless the user is uh, running in an infinite. So we're passing the infinite loop uh, caution to the user and it doesn't apply to the code in itself. Okay, so before anyone jumps, I actually lied. And although this code does compile and work, the code I sh just showed, it's non standard conforming because coroutines are not allowed to have an auto return type. That's uh, an MSVC a feature or extension uh, when, that when it encounters an auto return type, it automatically creates an STD experimental generator T um, as the return type. Maybe auto return types will be supported in the future, but the reason it cannot be supported at this moment is because there is no such thing or no standard class called STD generator. The C++20 standard will not ship with any standard coroutine support library. And what we're using here is Microsoft uh, uh, experimental library, uh, but I do hope that by C23, I know this is a very high priority, we will get a coroutine support library. And there are several great open source coroutine libraries if you're not, uh, for example, on Microsoft Visual Studio, like Lewis Baker's uh, CPP core library, and we'll see some more of it later. So let's see some examples. I once needed to process the neighborhood around the pixel only up to its closest neighbor. So my solution was to scan the image in an ever-growing spiral until bumping into the first neighbor. So on the top left, you can see a spiral generator around pixel zero, zero. Now, you can see the code is independent of an actual image or an image size, and it basically lazily spirals into infinity. I'm not gonna explain how it works, but I will point out that if you try to reason about it, it's much easier to reason about code written like this as a serial function than having the logic split between multiple methods. And you can see that the, U, the, the loop coils the current pixel position, and then upon resuming, it does some calculation, calculating the next position. Now, if we wanted to draw the spiral with some uh, pretty colors, we can create an RGB color generator that infinitely cycles through values of the hue channel if we're using the HSV color space and generating a smooth, varying bright colors. So in this case, I'm using OpenCV to do some color, uh, color conversion. So you can see we're creating the MAT3B. Those are uh, two single pixel images. And then we just return a converting, a starting at the color, HSV color 0, 25, 25. I don't know, I'm not sure what color that is, probably red. 
And then we're simply cycling through the HSV color space using OpenCV to convert it to RGB and co-yielding the RGB color for display because our displays are not, don't use HSV, they require RGB values. So now we have these wonderful, two wonderful infinite generators and we'd like to draw the animation uh, lazily and in lockstep, in tandem. So we can only use a, a single range, uh, uh, when we use a range for loop, we, only, we can only use a range for, for loop. So how do we iterate both it generators in tandem with a single loop? Hmm? Inner pod. Well, of course, let's zip them together. Now coroutines can be templates. So as you can see, this simple zip implementation it takes two generators, get their begin iterator, and walks them in tandem until one, either one of them, if ever, is done. And then it lazily yields a pair of their yielded values. Now, in Range's v3 library, there is a much more powerful zip view that should work very similar to this and uh, actually allow you to zip multiple ranges together. Um, I don't, I'm not sure zip is actually in the C20 ranges. But again, you see it's extremely simple to reason about this code. It's extremely simple to see what it does. And now we can compose it together in a range for loop with C17 structured bindings. So we're creating a single generators from two and iterating them in tandem, as we can see on the bottom. So we have a for loop taking pause and color, creating zip of spiral and huge gen, and then we're just extracting the color and setting it to the image. I think that's very, very cool. Now, um, let's see another example. Say we have a binary tree and we'd like to iterate over its nodes. So we might write something like this. Here we have three class methods in order, pre-order, and post-order that, that are in fact coroutines. So now we can see that coroutines can be not only functions and templates, they can actually be methods as well. And one regular non-coroutine methods order, which is going to return a coroutine generator. Now each traversal function recursively traverses the child, uh, the child nodes and co the value of the tree, the value in the node. So given a tree node head, we can iterate over the tree elements with the chosen order and it will print uh, the relevant order. Now, If you look at order, you can see that it's returning uh, the type. The return type is actually uh, the generator created by, uh, would be generator T. So it's the value returned by each of the methods. So there's an interesting note here for the keen uh, observers that there's actually some type erasure happening below the surface because each of these methods has a different implementation. But I'm not gonna go into that. But let's take a look at in order. So in order checks if the left child is valid and then it basically uh, iterates and yielding all of the values by calling in order on that node. Then it co-yields the value and does the same thing on the right. Now the CPP core library provides an even more convenient alternative instead of the STD generator that we saw before, it's called a, a recursive generator. And it's very similar to generator, except that it's designed to be more efficient because in addition to being able to co-yield the value of type T, you can actually co-yield the value of recursive generator T. So when we co-yield the recursive generator value, it's actually going to generate all of the values uh, recursively. So I think this is probably the most concise way to explain how in-order tree traversal works. And uh, I have never seen something more compact than this. And it basically shows the idea of the algorithm without any additional craft. So, coroutines are a new feature and they're not devoid of problems and there are extremely heated discussions about how and why they should work or about how exactly in all the details, again, I'm kind of hiding a lot of compiler 
magic and gener uh, code generation that happens below the surface. But one of the very infamous problems with coroutines is called dangling references. So we can take a look at this code here. It seems reasonable. And we have a, a, co a, a coroutine called explode, which takes a, an STD string by reference and iterates over its values, yielding the characters one by one. And in our main function, we call it this hello, hello world, and uh, printing the characters. Now, once we run this, this is going to explode. And the reason is that in C++20, the coroutine is not really one indivisible routine. It's actually split up by the compiler into a bunch of little uh, fragments uh, about, at each suspension point. And because we have these suspension points, each coroutine needs to save its state from one uh, suspension point until it's resumed. And this state takes, for example, the uh, const std const string. And what, uh, so, let me put it this way. What is, what state is stored in, uh, that's uh, the part of the coroutine that stores the, the intermediate values is called the coroutine frame. And it needs a ch and it needs, of course, s. Now s is a const reference and that's created by the temporary hello world. Now, if we look uh, on, even on CPP reference, this is unrelated, not directly related to coroutines, we can see that when we're using a range for the actual code that's generated creates multiple statements. And there's a warning. Be aware that the lifetime of any temporary within range expression is not extended. So because we have multiple statements, the temporary that gets bound and with its lifetime extended is actually the generator, but the internal uh, string that we hope we were hoping to get bound to S, to, to, to S actually doesn't. So we're getting a uh, dangling reference. And sadly, this is the simplest version. And there are many, many more difficult, more subtle and devious examples of these dangling uh, coroutines. I think there are people trying to make this a little bit more uh, palatable. But again, we'll, uh, until then, take care to take coroutine arguments by value. So to summarize, you know, coroutines are new. They're really hot of the press, and they're not perfect, and they're not complete in many senses of the word. So though they can be templates, as we've seen, they could be lambdas. Uh, they cannot return, uh, we cannot use return, the return keyword at the moment, although some compilers do support them at the moment. Uh, we, cannot, we saw that they are not actually allowed to use auto return types or concepts. Uh, they also cannot be const expert, they cannot be constructors, destructors, and in fact, the main, main cannot be a coroutine, although I'm not sure what that would mean. Um, I suspect some of these will actually be lifted as we gain more experience. We've seen this with lambdas, when they started very simple and then increasing in, in power from 14 and C plus 17 and 20. Um, but really beyond the current language limitations, there is the issue of the lack of standard library support. And I think that's probably the highest priority for the standard uh, to give us a nice support library uh, because even between the libraries that we do have, there is a quality of implementation uh, problem. Some of them support various features, others support them differently. And because there is no standard, there is no way to tell the difference. Now, the last thing is the, is the compiler quality of issue, a quality of implementation issue where some compilers will elide uh, heap allocations that happen for the coroutine frames. Others will try to do it in other cases. So this is also something that I hope will get better and better as we learn more about how coroutines are actually used in practice. So this is, as I said, a more, very motivational, very introductory talk about coroutines and generators. We, I try to focus on how we write coroutines and ranges. Uh, from the user perspective. Uh, and there's a lot more details that I'm kind of sweeping under the carpet here. Uh, and I'm really not doing justice to all the power of coroutines. So this is only a very small part of what coroutines can do. 
Uh, there are, there's a massive list of coroutine resources by Matt PD at this link. Uh, CPP Reference has a nice page about coroutines. There is a coroutine channel on Slack, which basically most, I think most of the committee members who are, are interested in implementing coroutines uh, hang out there, so feel free to go and ask. And I'm actually going to publish a more detailed version of this talk on my blog. It will be up uh, in the coming weeks. So uh, I hope you, had, you were stimulated enough to go and try coroutines. I think they're super awesome. So thank you very much for staying.